Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to cover patterns of cervical stenosis. This is an excerpt from a broader course on cervical spondylosis, which is age-related degeneration of the cervical spine. If you're interested in seeing the full course, we've left a link in the description. So now that we've spoken about the different structures that are affected by spondylosis, we're going to talk about how those structural problems of facet hypertrophy, ligament thickening, can cause narrowing that affects the spinal nerves. We're going to talk about something called cervical stenosis, and that is something that people see in their MRI reports and their CAT scan reports all the time, and that's something that people ask questions about all the time when I see them in clinic. So we're going to talk about it in some greater detail right now. Now again, when you look at this image that you should be pretty familiar with at this point, there's two real spaces or channels that we think about when we think about stenosis. Now stenosis means narrowing. When we talk about structures like the aorta, which is a big blood vessel, we call it aortic stenosis if there's narrowing in the aorta. When it's the carotid artery, we call it carotid stenosis. When it involves the spinal canal, we call it spinal stenosis. So there's two spaces that we're going to talk about in the spine. One is called the spinal canal, and that's this space right here that the spinal cord runs in. Now again, if you take a slice like this and look at a sagittal sequence, here you can see the spinal cord right here, and it runs in a tube called the spinal canal. Now if you look at a slice of it like this, this is what it looks like. It looks like just the uh, cross section through a tube. So that spinal canal is a long structure that runs from the base of your skull all the way down to your pelvis, your sacrum. Every level will have a little porthole. This is the second space to talk about called the neural foramen. And that's the structure that the nerve runs out of right here. Now we've spoken about that a little bit when we were talking about uncovertebral hypertrophy and facet hypertrophy, but that causes narrowing of this space, this little porthole, which is where the nerve leave, which is called the neural foramen. So let's talk first about spinal stenosis. The spinal canal is a structure that runs up and down the length of your spine that your spinal cord sits in. When people develop features of spondylosis, like what have we spoken about? We spoke about these disc herniations that people have over here sometimes. We talked about ligament hypertrophy. Sometimes people can have bone spurs. When there is narrowing of the spinal canal, we call that spinal stenosis. So here you can see this ligament thickening over here is causing pressure on the spinal cord. So narrowing of the spinal canal is called spinal stenosis. Sometimes we call that central stenosis because it's called the central spinal canal or the central canal. That's just a different name for it. When it affects the cervical spine, we call it cervical stenosis. Much like when it affects the lumbar spine, we call it lumbar stenosis. So cervical stenosis, central stenosis, and spinal stenosis are all roughly interchangeable, but they're referred to narrowing of this space that runs longitudinally the length of your spine, uh, containing the spinal cord and low down the spinal nerves. Now, people do not need to have stenosis at every level in their spine, but we do want to look for levels where there is stenosis. And because you can have punctuated levels of, say, ligament hypertrophy and disc herniation, some people will have, say, no stenosis at some level, and mild at some levels, and severe at some levels. And that is very common when we talk about spinal stenosis patterns. So when people have cervical stenosis, it can be from a few different things. It can be from disc herniations, like you see over here. It can be from ligament hypertrophy or ligament thickening, and it can be from bone spurs that typically will happen back here that can cause some pressure on the spinal cord. On occasion, like you can see here, the nerves that leave off the side can be under pressure from structures. Sometimes you'll get nerve compression, but classically when we think about cervical stenosis or central stenosis, we're worried about the spinal cord. That's different from foraminal stenosis, which we will talk about next. Now, if you took an image like this, that gives us that picture we were looking at, but again, if we go to an oblique image, this helps us really look at the foramen itself. So once again, the foramen is this little porthole that the nerve comes out of and there is a porthole or a foramen on either side. Here's one on the right, here's one on the left at every level. So you can see here's one at three, four, here's one at four, five. And which nerve comes out changes at every level. So it's C3, four, it's the C4 nerve, the C5 nerve. The, all of the nerves exit through one of these portholes and that's called the neuroforamen. Now, a neural foramen, again, is a porthole that the spinal nerves exit the spinal canal through. There's a foramen at 
every level and on each side, right and left. So if you have 24 levels in your spine, there's 48 neural foramina total from the top of your cervical to the bottom of your lumbar spine. Now, when people have foraminal stenosis, that means narrowing of the porthole, not necessarily narrowing of the spinal canal. So here you can see the spinal canal looks okay, but you see that there's some tight narrowing here on this side, the right side at this level, whatever level that ends up being. Here you can see that this foramen is wide open here. And if you took that oblique picture through it, you can see again that there's compression. In this case, the four five level, you can see there's disc herniation causing pressure on the nerves. So here people have, this would be C4-5 foraminal stenosis, on the right side, that is a consequence of disc herniation. This one would be a little different. There's a bit of disc and there's some bone spurs there, still causing foraminal stenosis, but at this five, six level, and then this six, seven causing foraminal stenosis from the front and the back, mostly from bone spurs. But the narrowing is the outcome. We don't really care. When we say foraminal stenosis, a lot of different things can cause it, but foraminal stenosis itself just means narrowing of the foramen, whatever its cause might be. Now, if you were to really formalize it, foraminal stenosis then is narrowing of the neural foramen, which can compress the exiting nerve. And I say can because we see people with, with foraminal stenosis who may have no symptoms. Classically, people will come in with an MRI scan that might, with maybe say right arm pain, and will have a lot of right-sided foraminal stenosis, but very frequently will have left-sided foraminal stenosis with no left arm symptoms. So it's very common to see people with narrowing that doesn't have symptoms. So I would say foraminal stenosis is narrowing of the foramen, which can cause uh, neural symptoms and can compress the exiting nerve. It can be caused by disc herniations, as you see up here, by facet hypertrophy or uncovertubal hypertrophy, like you see at the levels below. But whatever the cause is, foraminal stenosis means narrowing of this little porthole called the neural foramen. So when we talk about the topic of stenosis, it's important to be clear about where and what. Are we talking about central spinal stenosis and what level or levels are affected? Are we talking about foraminal stenosis and then what level and what sides are affected for each of those? And that goes into the decision making for management of people with cervical spondylosis. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.